coming start recording and yeah over to you okay great thanks for having me let me uh let me share my screen share and let me just get play okay can you see my screen yep okay great give me a second here Okay, so I uh, I run a boutique consulting firm in San Francisco. For years, I've been doing work in machine learning, applied machine learning, and AI. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a project I've put together, basically to sort of augment a lot of the work we do in industry, uh, to try to understand how deep learning works and build a diagnostic tool for it. Um, my background: I did my PhD at the University of Chicago in chemical physics, and then I was an NSF fellow at UIUC in a group that was a uh, theoretical physics biophysics groups and we were doing things like statistical mechanics of neural networks back in the 90s so i was introduced to these ideas back then i'm kind of amazed that it's all come back because it kind of died um you know there's a, there were a few people doing it in industry but now it's sort of really um exploded so um in, in particular i you know i've been working mostly in industry with a lot of companies like blackrock barclays um ebay um in, in particular a lot of the ideas i'm looking at came because I used to be a quant in the SAE group at BlackRock. And so we used a lot of random matrix theory to model the markets and to do portfolio theory. Um, but of course, it's very applied stuff. And so what happens, I took a lot of those ideas and we tried to apply it to deep learning and it turns out to work amazingly well. Now, this project is also in collaboration with an old friend of mine, Michael Mahoney, who is at UC Berkeley. Um, and he's a specialist in things like uh, randomized linear algebra, large scale machine learning, theory of machine learning, statistical learning theory. So he sort of convinced me a few years ago to sit down and look, why don't we, we, we recognize that so there's something new going on here with deep learning, the techniques and statistics and statistical learning theory just don't seem to apply to what's going on. And, you know, I, you know, look, you know, we have a number of techniques from theoretical chemistry, maybe we can, and finance, maybe we can apply them to come up with something. So we just started talking and we came up with something. So what we came up with uh, was this tool and a theory. Uh, the tool is actually, this is from our nature paper we published in nature communications last year. And the tool is called Weight Watcher. And what it, oh, sorry. What it is, is an open source tool that analyzes the weight matrices of neural networks and deep neural networks. It's a diagnostic tool. So if you're training a deep neural network, like we do with a lot of our clients in industry, it will look at the weight matrices of the model that you've pre-trained and will analyze them. So, you know, you take the model, you take, you take each of the weight matrices from each layer, you do spectral analysis, you know, compute the eigenvalues or the singular values, and you look at the histograms. And it turns out, there's a tremendous amount of information in the histogram of these eigenvalues that can tell you quite a lot about the uh, learning properties and the generalization properties of neural networks. So, we thought, well, this is really interesting. We're looking at this. Maybe we can build a theory around this that can help us understand why deep learning works and try to build a diagnostic tool. And in doing all this, realize that we're not looking at the data. Like, we're not looking at the training data. We're not looking at the test data. We're just looking purely at the weight matrices. And we're asking this question. Just looking at the weight matrix, the model, what can you say about a neural network? So we have a theory. Um, the theory, we, we sort of have a, um, a paper we talk about understanding deep learning requires rethinking generalizations. And, and the idea is we're gonna take some ideas from statistical mechanics and random matrix theory, and some ideas from the sort of theory of strongly correlated systems, and we're gonna mix them all up. I, I used to do quantum chemistry. In fact, I used to do semi-empirical quantum chemistry. So we're gonna kind of mix these ideas up. Uh, we're gonna use some old ideas, but we're gonna use them in a way that a lot of people probably don't use them because um, we're coming from a theory aspect, but also from an engineering aspect. Now, how can we use these ideas in an engineering aspect to build a tool? And so I'm gonna sort of talk about the tool and what we can do and sort of how the theory works at the beginning, the qualitative aspects of the theory for the first half of the talk. And then the second half, I'm actually going to go through our statistical mechanics and sort of explain the statistical mechanics motivations and how we got to where we are. So we have a number of papers in the field, um, the most notably um, implicit self-regularization, deep neural networks is sort of our heavy-tailed self-regularization theory, which was in JMLR. It's like 50, 60 page paper. Um, we have a paper predicting trends in the quality of state-of-the-art neural networks without access to training or test data. That's nature communications. Um, we have a number of other papers, and I'll try to be clear in the talk when I talk about things that have been published, gone through peer review, and we're very sure about. 
things that are sort of in press now. So we have a paper where we can train transformers from scratch. This is in press. And there are some things that are unpublished, some unpublished experimental results and some unpublished theoretical results. I'm going to talk a lot about those and love to get some feedback from you on. So the basic idea, just starting out, like, what are we doing? We have a, you have a neural network. Someone gives you a neural network, like VGG or ResNet or one of these big transformers. In this case, we're looking at the fully connected, third fully connected layer in VGG16. Take the weight matrix, compute its eigenvalues, plot the histogram on a log log plot. So we're analytical, we call the eigenvalues or we call sometimes the ESD, the empirical spectral density. So it's just a histogram of the eigenvalues on a log log scale. And what you find for neural networks that are trained very well, we see this empirically, this empirically, that they fit a power law distribution. And this seems to be that for a wide variety of neural networks, when they're trained, when they're pre-trained and they've been trained very well, they fit a power law distribution. In other words, you have the, if you plot in a log log plot, you get a nice straight line, the tail. This is where the tail starts and you get a nice straight line. Uh, this is an example of a good fit. This is a bad fit. And the idea is that the tail of the spectral density and particular shape of this, the shape of this plot contains a huge amount of information. Now, normally in statistical learning theories, I understand it, um, the way Mike sort of explains is that mostly people look at the scale. So they'll look at the maximum eigenvalue of this plot and they'll try to make proofs about bounds and they'll try to make statements about the scale of the weight matrices. And what we're saying is that that's really not very informative and sometimes it actually gives qualitatively the wrong result. So looking at the shape is much more important than looking at the scale. And this is sort of the, the big idea that's gonna underpin what we're doing. Now, as I said, you can take these spectral densities you can fit them to a power law or a truncated power law. So you know, have a density row of lambda where lambda is the eigenvalue and it fits to some exponent minus alpha, uh, you know, lambda to the minus alpha. And what we find is when you fit the tail, in many cases, alpha lies between two and six empirically. And so we're gonna sort of, and we've studied a lot of these matrices and we find this out that if you look empirically, you get these plots and alpha is between two and six. It's not usually less than two which is interesting. And we sort of are gonna discuss how we think this could be cast in the framework of a heavy tailed random matrix theory, where this is sort of a universality class. We think that these tails exist, they live in some universality class of heavy tailed random matrices, but not too heavy tail. And what you find empirically, if you take our tool and you, you, you plot, you'll find that well-trained layers are generally very heavy tailed and they're well-shaped. So they, they have a good fit. The, the quality of the fit, B was the kamal gauss smirnoff distance. The quality of the fit is good and they have a good shape. So this is another example. This is actually a, an arbitrary layer from one of the open AI models, GPT-2, which was released a couple of years ago. Moreover, we can actually compare layers. And what you'll see, for example, here, this is an example of GPT, which is one of these large transformer models that released by open AI. And this is GPT-2, and it's the same model. It's just that GPT was trained, it wasn't trained on enough data. So OpenAI sort of built this model and they released it a few years ago. And it's, well, we're gonna train it on just uh, sort of deficient because we don't want people to be generating fake text and generating fake news. And then later they said, well, we wanna sell this to you. So we're gonna give you this, this model which can generate fake text, but it's not as good as the one we sell. Um, and then they have GPT-3 and GPT-J, and there's a wide range now of these models which generate fake text, and you can do all sorts of things with them. But the key idea here is that these models are exactly the same, except GPT has not been trained as well as GPT-2. And what you find is that if you look at the alpha exponent in GPT-2, GPT, it's alpha is about 4.129. But in the better trained model, alpha is a little smaller, it's 3.393. Moreover, if you look at the shape, you see that in, the, in, the, in this layer in GPT, it sort of looks straight line, but you know, the fit's kind of curly, curvy and there's sort of this large outlier out here. Whereas you look in GPT-2, it's the much straighter fit and you don't have this sort of weird outlier at the, uh, this, at the tail, way in the tail. So this is consistent with what we see empirically, that when you look at deep neural networks, better trained layers are more heavy tailed so the exponent is a little smaller and they're better shaped. 
how do I make it more quick? Here. Um, now, what's going on here? Typically in random matrix theory, you guys think about random matrix theory, you think about something like Markov Pasteur theory. You have a rectangular matrix. And random matrix theory says if the weight matrix, which are these are rectangular matrices, real rectangular matrices in these drone networks, if they were simple Gaussian random matrices, then they would have a very simple form. The spectral density would have a well-known form, which basically depends on the shape of the weight matrix, you know, the aspect ratio Q. And so if Q is one, you sort of get this sort of this shape where the red, the red curve, which kind of cuts off here. If Q is 10, you get this sort of sim, almost a semicircle type shape. But the idea is that if W was a simple random Gaussian matrix and you were to plot it, you would see something that looks like this shape. And you would find that the edges are very crisp. And maybe there are some fluctuations, but you'd get something that looks very, very much like these curves. When you look at real data, they don't look like this. If you look at real data, here's again, here's an example of AlexNet, one of the older models that were first, about 10 years ago, first kicked off the craze in deep learning, one of the computer vision models on AlexNet. These are simple, fully connected layers, FC1, FC2. If you look at them, this is the fit to random matrix theory, the Marchenko pasteur fit. And this is the reality. The blue is reality. And again, if you look at FCT2, and here we kind of zoom in, this is the best fit to random matrix theory, the RMT. And this is the blue is the reality. And the Weight Watcher tool will actually automatically do these fits for you. You can feed it a neural network. You can specify MP fit. It will rescale the network and figure out the, it will find the optimal fit for you. So we'll actually do this for you and we'll show you. And what we see consistently across the board is that we've never seen a single weight matrix that looks like a random matrix. They're all heavy tailed. So what we conjecture is that these are strongly correlated systems. So the idea is that in, we're going to model the spectral density as if W is heavy tailed. Now we're not saying that W is heavy tailed. We're saying that the eigenvalues of W are heavy tailed. This is a different statement, but we're going to model it. So we're going to say, look, if W is heavy tailed, it would also have, then the ESD would also have heavy tails. If W is strongly correlated, we're going to sort of conjecture that it can be modeled as if W is drawn from a heavy tail distribution with some caveats. So we're going to sort of use heavy uh, random matrix theory. We're going to sort of make these assumptions that we're sort of drawing W from this universality class and it looks heavy tailed, but we're not making the claim that W is heavy tailed. In fact, we actually don't think W is ever heavy tailed unless the regularizer fails. And then this is an example. We sort of got this idea from quantitative finance. I think this is from one of JP's actual papers where this is real world data from the market. This is market data. And this sort of this green plot is a marching pasture fit. So we're taking sort of the same ideas that were used in finance that, you know, when you look at real data, it's heavy tailed, it doesn't fit, it's correlated, and it doesn't fit this marching pasture theory well at all. And what we found is we've looked at thousands, tens of thousands of these weight matrices, they're all always heavy tailed to one extent or another. So an example, we've looked at hundreds of models and what we did was we're, I think we're probably the first ones to ever do this in, in, science, in, the, in the industry and in the, in, in, the, in the literature. We looked at hundreds of pre-trained models. There are lots and lots of pre-trained models, you know, but the magic of deep learning is you can train a model, you can give it to somebody else and they can fine tune it or they can just use it out of the box. And right now there's a company called Hugging Face and they, they have sort of an archive of thousands of these. So we started going through these a few years ago. When we started, there were only 50 of them available. Now I think there's probably 5,000. And we started looking at different models. Lynette, Lynette 5, which we retrained ourselves. AlexNet, Inception, ResNet, DenseNet, so on and so on. And in every single case, when we looked at the weight matrices, we found that they were heavy tailed. And, and so we sort of formulated a qualitative uh, phenomenological theory which we called heavy-tailed self-regularization. And, and this is described in our GMLR paper. We sort of lay out sort of a phenomenology of how to look at these weight matrices and make statements about what we think their behavior is. And now it, we've, in a good, good example of this is if you look at a large number of, if you look at all the layers in GPT versus GPT-2, I'll give you an example from our nature paper. Not only do we find that the weight matrices are heavy tailed, but we find that for models that are better trained, in this case, red is better than blue, the alphas 
uh, for every layer, usually lie between, you know, some of two and six, and which we think is predicted by our phenomenological theory, or at least is described by it. And smaller alphas are better. So you see on average, here's the peak of GPT-2, it's the alphas around three and a half. On GPT, it's around four. We find this consistently that smaller alpha is better. And these large alphas usually correspond to just bad fits. You know, we tried to fit the thing and it wasn't really a power law. It was a little more complicated and, you know, it, it, it or it was more random. And so you just don't get a good fit. But generally, in other words, the shape, it's not the, the ESD is not shaped as well as a power law. So this is sort of our conjecture that deep learning systems, when you train them, the weight matrices are heavy tailed, smaller alpha is better, large alphas typically correspond to bad fits. So we've looked, for example, there's another paper we have from a few years ago, I think it was the ICML physics uh, session, where we looked at this case, 500 matrices over 50 architecture. Now I've looked at thousands of these and we compute the linear layers and we have sort of a way of computing the alpha for the, convolute, the 2D convolutional maps. And what we find is that 80 or 90% of the layers are the alphas less than four. Almost all of them are between two and, uh, you know, two and six. They're in this sort of range right here. So there's sort of what we call sort of a, I could have called it a universality. It's not really universality in the physics sense. It's just sort of, we find that all of the weight makers we believe live in these, this universality class empirically. Oh yeah, this is, so this is 7,500 weight matrices taken from ImageNet. So these are computer vision models. So this, this plot is for computer vision models. But we find this with the um, NLP models as well. Uh, what you'll find is the NLP alphas are a little larger than the computer vision alphas. And we have sort of a, an explanation for that sort of at the end of the talk. So here's our phenomenology from our, H, our um, HCSR, our JMLR paper. If you start training, a model and you, you're training the deep neural network, you have to give it an initial weight matrix. Every layer has to have an initial weight matrix. And again, we're looking at the individual layers. So you look at the layer weight matrix, you start off, you usually start with a Gaussian random matrix. And it usually fits Marchenko Pasteur very well. Um, and then as you start to train or you start to increase the regularization, in this case, what we did is we took a model, a sort of very simple model, we made the batch size very, very large, knowing that if we did that, it would not generalize very well. And then we shrank the batch size systematically. So we have complete control over um, that we, 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 and as you shrink the batch size, it, it generalizes better and better and better. Very toy model with simple behavior. As you, as you increase the correlation, you find these little spikes sort of pull out of the edge of the Marchenko Pasteur distribution. And you get the sort of bike bulk plus spikes region and the spikes begin to pull out. And we found that in smaller older neural networks, th this is very common. And then as you get to large modern neural networks of very small batch sizes, you sort of get this bleeding out region. So you, you actually see the, the edge starts to disappear in the Martinko test distribution and you get something that's heavy tail. And so what we believe is that sort of the training of deep neural networks is inducing a kind of breakdown of the Gaussian random structure and the onset of a type of heavy-tailed self-regularization. I took the idea of self-regularization from an old paper from Dieter Srené, uh, where he talked about self-organization um, using these kinds of models, although he was using the bulk plus spike model, but this is sort of the idea. So we have this paper called, uh, where we talk about the five plus one phases of training. And basically what we do is we give a little phenomenology. We label these different types of weight matrices you might see, purely random-like, random-like, but with some bleeding out, a uh, bulk plus spike region, a bulk decay region, and then a heavy tailed. And then there are cases where you actually see singularities. So you see rank collapse in the weight matrix. And this sort of phenomenology, and again, if you run the Weight Watcher tool, it will actually generate these plots. It doesn't label the, it doesn't actually give you the labels, it will generate the plots and for each layer you get a plot and you kind of see what's going on. And, and you can kind of qual it'll actually count the number of spikes for you and things like that. So then in the paper, we sort of talked this idea, well, gee, how do we apply random matrix theory to this? Well, we sort of went through these old, all the old literature um, and talks uh, in particular by, by you guys, you know, by JP and Potters and, and other people. And we just sort of went through the literature, wrote down everything we saw and made a table. And what we found is that these are our, our are various kinds of what we call heavy-tailed universality classes. 
I, I, you know, to what extent are they rigorous, semi-rigorous? Basically, the idea is that this sort of corresponds to our, our qualitative pictures. And what you find is that if, if you were to model, if you were to model the weight matrices as if they were drawn from a heavy tilt distribution, they would have an exponent mu. And when mu is between two and four, you sort of get this fat-tailed region here, heavy, moderate, and fat-tailed. And you get a, a shape. You can sort of get a shape for what is the finite ESD and what is the limiting shape of the ESD and what we expect that there's no bulk edge and what the tail statistics look like. And what we believe is that the empirically, what we find the way we're doing the fits in our, in our approach is that the neural network, deep learning layers, the weight matrices sort of live in what we call this fat tailed universality class. So hopefully I got it right. I went through the literature, read everything I could. Try, we just tried to make a, a table of what we found. And this is where we believe things are. And we believe it's very, very different, right? These are, these are very different kinds of behavior that we see. And we actually looked at the shape of the SDSDs and we find that we see this sort of, this is the shape we see. We see this very specific behavior that you can characterize um, and you can characterize the amount of correlation. That is how well the models actually generalize by looking at the exponents of the finite shape of the global ESD. And we can do some other interesting things as well. For example, we can actually predict trends and generalization. So here's an example of where, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back, where we take, someone took, a, this is a paper, this contest postmortem paper, basically um, a bunch of people trained a bunch of models, they gave it to us, they had a contest and said, can you predict how well the models generalize? And what we did is, well, we broke the models down by the depth. So each one of these lines represents a class of models which are trained with a different number of layers. Uh, the label, the, the two actually may have more layers and two depth and two, just the labels that they had in the model. And what we find is if you plot the average alpha, and here we're just gonna take the alpha of every weight matrix and just naively average it for every layer. You know, the most a naive, simplest thing you can do, we make a metric, and Weight Watch will produce this metric. And we say this average alpha, that, that should correlate with the actual predicted, with the actual test accuracy of the model. So this is the actual accuracy of the model. This is the model, um, our metric, which is data independent, doesn't ever see the data. And what you find is that you get pretty good straight lines. Um, in particular, when the models have very high test accuracy, we find that the theory works pretty well because you get good fits. When the models have low act test accuracy, we also get fit, but the models, the fit doesn't work as well because the layer matrices aren't as well heavy tailed. So you're, it's harder to get a fit. There's more noise in the fits. And, but nevertheless, we see these correlations. We also have a, a little bit of a Simpsons paradox here. It turns out that if you, if you try to just take the average alpha and use it to treat, the, to try to predict the generalization accuracy across all the models, it actually sort of behaves in the opposite direction. So you sort of a little bit of Simpsons paradox here that we saw. And we have this paper where we discuss these various Simpsons paradoxes we found in looking at this contest data. Now, what's interesting is if you take what people do in statistical learning theory, which is they look at the scale, the maximum eigenvalue, and you try to plot the scale, it turns out the scale also shows the Simpsons paradox, but in the opposite direction. So it turns out the, the scale of the weight matrices actually correlates pretty well, small, um, Smaller scale corresponds to better test accuracy as predicted by theory, by their theory, if you look across layers. But if you actually vary the, the regularization parameters, the amount of dropout or, you know, the momentum, they actually behave, you actually don't get good fits at all, or the scale behavior is actually the opposite direction. So if you look at, if you use purely norm-based scale metrics from statistical learning theory, you actually can get opposite behavior. You can actually get behavior that's anti-correlated, uh, where our theory actually shows the correct behavior. Now, if you combine the two, if instead of taking an, a naive average alpha, you take a scale-weighted alpha, and we call this alpha hat, is whatever reason we call it alpha hat, it's weighted alpha or a scale-weighted alpha. And if you take a weighted average of the alphas, it turns out not only do you get pretty good fits to the test accuracies as you vary the hyperparameters, you also get the right behavior across models when you change the number of layers. So we call this thing alpha hat. And this is the metric which I'm going to derive for you using some simple techniques from statistical mechanics. 
Uh, now, before I do that, I'm going to point out we, we've done, we've looked at Alpha Hat across hundreds of models. Here's an example of the various VGG, VGGB, and all these various pre trained models we just downloaded off the internet. Again, we don't have access to the training data or the test data. We're simply plotting our alpha metric versus test accuracy. And we find that we get pretty good linear plots, amazingly. And with you know a good RMSE and a good R, squ good R squared and Kendall Tau, which is a rank correlation metric. We've done this across hundreds of models for CV and NLP. And this is the basis of our nature paper. And we see, for example, here's ResNet. Here's a few of the ResNet models. You get a pretty good fit. If you put every ResNet in from ResNet 10 to ResNet, actually you go all the way up to 1,000, I think at some point, you actually get a, you also get a straight line. Now, obviously there's more data, so the fit is not quite as tight, but you still get pretty good fits. And we show that we actually do pretty well and we do better than what anybody else was doing in particular with the data independent metrics. So we, again, we've shown this across over five, we've, we've picked many, many, we've looked at you know, 500 architectures, self attempt them, broke them down to about 100 different models, looked at different regressions. You can go to the nature paper, but basically what we found is that the heavy tailed shape metrics, either this alpha hat or the chat norm, alpha hat is an approximation to a chat norm, actually correlates pretty well with the test accuracy. So we're kind of surprised. It's kind of amazing to, to us that this works. And I'll let you, you know, you, you can, and, and again, with the Weight Watcher tool, we try to make everything 100% reproducible. So if you want to try to reproduce this, you can use the tool. You might need to ask me, there might be some options you need to set, you know, to make sure it works on the models you're using. But we tried to do this and make it 100% reproducible. Uh, you can do some other things as well. Like you can look at how alpha depends on the, on the depth as you move through. Um, and what we find is that if you look at the actual layer alpha, layer by layer, and you plot it, you find that as you train models, excuse me, these are pre-trained models. If you look at this, is this represents the first layer, so it's near the data, and these last layers are near the labels. In some architectures like VGG, the alphas start off pretty small, and they get larger. In models like ResNet, which have some residual connections, which connect the layers together, the alphas are always consistently around two, pretty much until you get to the end. And in DenseNet, which is basically a model which has every everything's connected to everything else. Every layer is connected to every other layer with residual connections. The alphas are all over the place. And so this gives us this idea that we think that alpha is a measure of correlation. It's a measure of the information that each layer learns from the data. And if the models are sort of old fashioned models, it's hard to transfer information from the earlier layers to the later layers. If you add residual connections, you see the information transfer. And this is consistent with other people who look at information transfer in neural networks. Um, it turns out if you, now we, we, what we're doing sort of is very, very crude, sort of gross level, you know, looking at different architectures and looking at gross level changes in the test accuracy. If you're trying to do very, very accurate calculations, you need something a little more advanced. So it turns out when you try to fit these tails, sometimes you'll get a good fit. So here's an example of using this sort of off the shelf tool. You'll put this layer in, here's the log log plot. This is what it looks like, a linear plot. Here's sort of a log linear plot. And here's the, the distance. This is the quality of the fit versus where we pick the tail. Where does the tail start? Because the tail always ends at the end. So where does the tail start? In some cases, it's easy to fit. In some cases, it's hard. In cases where it's hard, you just have, you have a, you know, the, sort of a degeneracy. We can't figure out where the tail should be. It turns out these are, more the, these kinds of models are actually more like truncated power laws. And so we have, uh, so a truncated power law is X to minus alpha plus this exponential tail that cuts off. And it turns out this, this exponent, this cutoff actually is a, a quality metric as well. And you can use that. And you can run Weight Watcher and you can say fit truncated power law. You can say trunk fit extended truncated power law. And there are some various options you can use to try to get more accurate fits of the shape. And again, to try to come up with some sort of empirical quality metric. Now, the alphas will be different when you do this. Sometimes the alphas are the same. Sometimes they're different, depending on the truncated power law. But the tool will do it for you. Uh, we have a paper now with Yao Cheng Yang, Michael Mahoney, a bunch of other people. And the idea is here, we, um, yeah, what Yao Cheng did is he took some transformer models of various, various transformer models with various, various data sets of different sizes. And he trained them to state-of-the-art accuracy. And then he compared the model quality, which is a blue score, which is used for machine learning translation. 
and he compared that to this exponent, this this thing up here, this exponent. He found that oh, the exponent actually correlates really well, and you can get good quality metrics. And we have some other shape metrics as well. So we call these shape metrics. These are shape metrics, and these shape metrics we actually track the learning curve epoch by epoch. So you can track the learning curve. So we have, so when you need highly accurate results, you know you got to use a more sophisticated theory, which can capture the shape better, but we can do that now. Now, before I go into the system mechanics part, I'll talk about why we sort of think this works and where the ideas came from. And so my advisor in Chicago was friends with a guy named um, uh, um, Jack Cowan, who developed some of the original models for spiking neurons. And if you look at empirical data on spiking neurons, you find that they undergo these sort of avalanches. There's a whole group of people who study self-organized criticality and avalanche. They look at these spiking neurons and they develop all these, this, this machinery to fit the patterns of these spiking neurons to power laws. They, they try to figure out when, when do the avalanches occur, what's the distribution, and it turns out they're power laws. Sometimes you get power laws that sort of uh, truncate down. Sometimes they sort of come out like this, but th that, that's, you get the sort of finger that sticks out. But we actually, what we did is we took the power law fitting tools that they developed for these spiking neurons, and we applied them to these um, layer weight matrices. And it turns out that, again, this is, this is just random, some random paper I found in the literature on, on this stuff. I'm not an expert in this at all by any means. But I do know there's something called the critical brain hypothesis. And this is sort of this idea that came back when I was a grad student, uh, about self-organized criticality. There was a, a very famous book back then called How Nature Works by Prabhak. And, and the idea was that there are these systems that sort of self-organize and they self-organize and you can detect the signature of the self-organized behavior by looking at the actual power laws uh, in, in these plots. And what you find is that in simple systems, you know, simple neural systems, and by the way, this is a paper, again, a plot I took out of someone's paper on self-organized criticality. What you'd find is that simple systems are, you know, there's nothing going on. In more complex systems, you see power law behavior. If you do one of these fits, you get power law. And in the more complicated systems, you get truncated power law. And so we see the exact same behavior. You know, if we try to fit these neural networks, if you have simple models, well, simple, they're production quality pre-trained models, and you fit them to a power law, you get pretty interesting behavior and you can get a good qualitative fit to the generalization accuracy. If you want to get really, really accurate fits to the generalization, actually, you have to use a truncated power law method. So that's sort of the empirical side of the talk. So this is our, our empirical analysis, what we believe is true from the empirical studies we've done, um, our qualitative phenomenology, and sort of some motivation by looking at experimental data on real neurons. Um, I have a, a, a the, we have this tool, we wrote an open source tool so that you can reproduce the work and you can apply it in production. So you can do all sorts of things with the tool, which I haven't discussed and I have a, uh, and we have a Slack channel. So if you, you know, if you're training your own neural networks, download the tool, GitHub, you know, wait, calculated content, Weight Watcher, um, join the Slack channel and we can help you with it. So we're looking for earlier adopters and collaborators who would like to sort of study this phenomenon in real systems. Now I'm, I'm gonna kind of take a break and I'm gonna kind of go into more detail of the statistical mechanics. And since you guys are experts in this, um, don't beat me up too much because this is stuff I haven't seen since you know I was 23. But um, I've been doing this work with Michael and another fellow, um, um, uh, uh, excuse me, um, Mirko, uh, another fellow Mirko, and we're sort of Mirko Mattelli, I may be pronouncing his name wrong. He's a great theoretical physicist. He was just sort of helping us out to formalize a lot of this. None of this has really been published yet other than in you know, some conference proceedings. So I'm just, this is sort of the first time I'm going through this to, for you. But I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a, a, a sketch of how we can derive the alpha hat metric. And, and again, the idea being that the alpha hat is basically something like a log of a shat norm of the correlation matrix. And so we're gonna sort of show you how you can do that using some old fashioned statistical mechanics uh, and some more modern random matrix theory. So we have to start with why in the world does this work at all? And I think people in the deep learning and AI community just have no idea. To them, this is just magic. Like how in the world could you do this? And sort of my personal look, I remembered this model from when I was a postdoc called the student teacher model. 
Uh, it's described in a book called England Vanderbrock. It, I don't think they invented it. Maybe somebody, it's it sort of been in the literature in the 90s. It was very common. But the idea is that if you take a multi, you have these sort of, back then we had these multi-layer feed-forward neural networks and you would model them as a simple perceptron. And you would ask, can I predict the generalization accuracy of a perceptron? And so this is what the model looked like. This is the perceptron. There's just uh, the data. So you imagine you have um, some data coming in. The data is Gaussian. So you have Gaussian data. And the data is feeding into these. And these are um, weights. So you have a, a perceptron is just a, like a single layer model. But instead of a matrix, it's just a vector. And the idea is you have a student, J, for some reason it's called J in the literature, and a teacher, T. And you could think of the teacher as like the ground truth. I trained a model, I'm the teacher. You're a student. I want you to train a model which predicts the same labels as I do. So my labels are just given as uh, the input data, dot product with the teacher weights, take the sum. So, you know, obviously it's dot product. And you, know, so you multiply, so it's a dot product between these two vectors and just take the sign of the vector. It's either one or minus one. Um, and so that gives me a model, a simple model for uh, a, a neural network, a perceptron layer. And the teach the student has to guess by choosing its weights, the teacher's labels. And, and so the idea of the model is that you, you set it up as I'm going to assume I have Gaussian IID data. I'm going to write down these expressions for the labels. I'm going to average over the data. And then I'm going to average uh, over all the teacher, all the possible teachers, um, which, which will give me an effectively an average over all the possible students. So the idea is you're asking how many possible ways are there for a student to guess what the teacher is actually, how the teacher is labeling the data. And so in this case, the idea is that the data is sort of uh, a type of quench disorder in the system. The learning parameters are giving you the optimization. So in, the, in this formulation, we would call, we're, we're gonna say that you have sort of a version space volume. So the idea is you have a teacher, we're going to guess that the teacher generates the labels, but we're gonna, in this model, which is a little, a little goofy to me, but you're gonna average over all the teachers in some way. So you have for every, for every, you have a version space for every teacher and for every input data set an integral over all the possible students that could generate the same labels as the teacher times this, this, this constraint on the version space volume on the phase space, which is basically the microcanonical measure. And it's the classifier. And it just says, if the student has the same label as the teacher, you give this a one. If the student has a different label than the teacher, you give it a zero. So it's a heavy side step function. Um, and so we're going to write down the version space volume subject to these constraints. So this is an example. This is um, great pictures that Mirko drew for me. I don't want to take credit for his, his work. He's helped, really helped explain a lot of this. You have the space face manifold and the volume, which is occupied by the classifier. So this is your version space for the data in the teacher, which is an integral over all the students. And this sort of black regions represent that subspace of the phase space, which represents the volume occupied by the system. And this volume element is what's going to give you an, it's going to give you an estimate of the generalization error, the test error of the student. And so the idea being that the, the error in any of these models, and, and we sort of take it qualitatively, the error in a deep learning model is somehow related to a volume in phase space. So this is sort of what it looks like. And again, we're not doing any replica calculations in, in, in any of this. It's very, just the simplest thing you can do you're going to take an average over the Gaussian data. And in the classical student teacher model, you average over the uniform random teachers. I bring this up because we're not going to do that, but that's how they set it up. So you have an integral and you sort of have these delta functions and you expand the delta functions. And in the end, you're going to end up with an expression for the generalization error of a perceptron, which depends on some term, which is independent of the, of the data. And then some term, which depends on the number of parameters of the size of the data set. And usually in the model, what they would do is they would, they would come up with this uh, function. 
they would plot it, they'd make some argument it doesn't scale correctly, go do some replica calculations, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the general form of how the theory works. Now, the key idea in this is that the error is actually rep is related to the dot product between the student and the teacher. So you, there's a nice paper by Engel in theoretical computer science, and people tell me I'm not doing computer science. I well, we used to they used to publish this stuff in NIPS in computer science. This is to me computer science. Um, the error is related to the overlap between this in this model between the student and the teacher, and you end up the, if you write down this final expression for the generalization error, you get this term lamb, uh, omega naught, which looks like an integral over all possible r. All possible, all possible overlaps. Excuse me, it's a function of the overlap. You're going to integrate eventually over R times this delta function between R and the overlap between the student and the teacher, average over the teachers. So this is the key idea from this model. I, I won't go into too much about the model. Say this sort of setup. We're going to use the same basic setup to derive alpha hat, but we're going to do something a little different. What we're going to do is we're going to say instead of having vectors, we're going to have real matrices. The student matrices are n by m rectangular matrices. And we're going to assume that they're very, very correlated. So the model's already been trained. So they're correlated because they're learning the correlation of the data. They must be correlated. And we know from our empirical data that if you look at this, so W is the, is the teacher, um, W or T, we're going to call it T here, but and sometimes they're called W. J is the student. We know that the teacher is heavy tailed. And since the teacher is heavy tailed, we're going to assume that the students probably are heavy tailed also. And they have the same exponents. So we're gonna sort of make this sort of modeling assumption that if we assume that the teachers look like, if the students look like the teachers, then we're going to solve for the total integrated version space. So we're not gonna find omega as a function of epsilon. We're gonna to try to integrate over the whole space, but we're gonna do it instead of in the micro canonical ensemble, we're gonna do it in the canonical ensemble. So the idea being here's the version space again, uh, the integral over all possible students times this, uh, this measure. But in this case, we're going to use a canonical measure, which is just what sometimes is called Gibbs learning. We built the canonical measure by looking at the mean squared error between the student and the teacher. So we have a student, teacher, you look at the mean squared error, you can expand it out, you get this nice simple form, which is one minus the trace. And if you assume then you have Gaussian data, um, and you work all this out, basically you're gonna take the, the, you're gonna take the average over the data, over your input data, which we assume to be IID Gaussian data, which obviously it's not, we're gonna make that assumption. You end up with a nice expression uh, in terms of the, the student teacher overlap, which is now the trace of JT transpose squared. And so this is sort of the modeling assumption. Okay, now we can represent this um, integral over the version space in terms of the student teacher overlap. Then what we do, uh, you can imagine now we're going to integrate this term over all the possible students. So we have to go dr, r minus this. We input, we input this delta function and it's gonna look, you end up with a, an expression which looks like this. And then you expand the delta function in r and you end up with a term which looks like an integral over all students, e to the i lambda r, e to the minus trace, j t squared. So you, again, you're gonna see that this looks, this expression looks, I'm again, I'm just kind of giving you a sketch of what we've done. Um, the idea is that this part depends, again, depends on the, the size of the data P. This part is sort of the omega naught face face um, volume, which is independent of the data sets. And this is the part we want to look at. So we want, now here's sort of where we diverge from. So up, up till now, everything is just student teacher. You can derive it. Merco would derive all this. Where it's all just standard student teacher stuff, and I can share with you. We can kind of go through in more detail later how we derive this. It. All it's all vanilla out of the box stuff. Now we sort of deviate. Now it, it gets a more semi empirical. And here the idea is that we want to rewrite this data independent part of the space space of uh, the version volume as an uh, HCIZ integral. So we're going to do a wick rotation, and we get this term lambda, which was done beta, where beta is just you know minus i lambda. And we're going to get something which looks like we're going to get an integral over the students, e to the minus beta trace j t try trace the overlap between all students with the teacher. And, and now we're going to rewrite because this is squared. We're going to rewrite this trace as trace of w a w. Again, sorry. Sometimes I I'm sorry about the notes. Sometimes I use t and sometimes I use w for the teacher. I didn't even catch that, but they're the same thing. The t and w are the same thing here. Sorry about that. So now we're going to fix the teacher. 
You're going to fix the teacher. W then is the teacher that we observe. It's fixed. It's fixed. We observed it. It's your pre-trained model. It's the model you're trying to predict the generalization error of. And we're going to average over all possible students, which could look like the teacher. And, and in fact, we're not even going to average over the students. We're going to average over all the student correlation matrices. So we're going to make a modeling assumption. And, and this is sort of a, a bit of a step. And we've, you know, some, we've had some debate about whether we can and can't do this. But you know, I, I don't want to present this as, you know, as if we've worked out all the details. But we're going to make this modeling assumption that we're going to look at all possible students where the correlation matrices look like the teacher. Why is that? Well, what, what is the thing that we're measuring empirically? We're measuring the spectral density. That's what we're using in the theory. So we, even though we have the, the W, we, what we have really, what we measure is the, the spectral density of W transpose W. But it turns out you can write down this expression and now we can look at the average of this part of the, the version space, the data independent part of the version space over, over all possible correlation matrices. So all students that are heavy tailed. And we get an expression which looks like one over N and then the large N, one over N, expected value uh, over all students times this, um, this term, which this ex exponential of the overlap. This is an HCI integral, which has been worked out by Tanaka. Um, and it turns out this expression gives you a sum over what I call uh, these generating functions, what I call for the machine learning people sort of generalized norms. And so this, you, you can write, this is just right out. You just basically pull this right out of Tanaka. That's all I'm doing is pull. You haven't re-derived it. I'm just pulling it right out of Tanaka. And I'm going to make this modeling assumption that I can model this part of the error by, by looking at this generalized norm. And I call it that because it's, a, it's going to, it looks like a sum of eigenvalues in the machine learning. People have norms, which are sums of functions of eigenvalues, like, you know, for Venus norm. And you're going to say that you can infer the functional form of G by looking at the empirical eigenvalues of the teacher. And so we know the teacher is heavy tail. So we know it's our transform yeah. in random matrix of the R. I'm sorry, did you have a question? Okay. So you know the R transform is just given by Z to alpha minus one. It's given by Berta for very heavy tailed systems. For the universe, and it turns out this works when alpha is less, when our mu's are less than three. So it works for a large part of our models. We're going to say that the teacher has the same, the student has the same functional form as the teacher. And then if you plug in and you do a few sort of um, crude approximations, you can show that the log of this sum is approximately equal to log uh, lambda max times alpha. So we have a sort of a sketch of how we can obtain the Weight Watcher power law metric by starting with the original student teacher model from statistical mechanics, writing down an expression for, you know, for, for a given layer, let's assume we have a one layer neural network, we write down an expression, a generalized expression for a matrix generalized expression for the, er the, the error. Then we're gonna apply this semi-empirical approach. We're not gonna derive everything exactly yet, but sort of the sketches that we would apply this approach. We end up with an expression from Tanaka, which is these generalized norms. And with a little approximations, you, you get down to this. Um, I talked a little bit before about why, what, what does this have to do now with why deep learning works and some of the reasons people try to understand is when, when deep learning first came out, I think a lot of uh, computer scientists thought it was a widely non-convex optimization problem, which was impossible to solve. And sort of we sort of sort of suspected from protein folding and energy landscape theory, no, we really think that the global energy landscape of a neural network is ruggedly convex. And so I knew there were these old papers by uh, on sort of rational decisions, random matrices, and spin glasses by, forgive me if I pronounce this incorrectly, uh, Galeuccio, uh, Bouchard, and Potters. And I remembered this paper from when I was a quant. And this is sort of the idea. You were sort of taking this paper and we're casting it, it we're taking the results of this. Because really the, these, this idea here really comes out of that paper. I mean, the idea is just simply have to reformulate in terms of rectangular matrices instead of square matrices. And what we find is that what we believe is if you look at the alpha exponent, that the size of the exponent tells you something about the landscape. And what we believe, what we saw in computer vision models is that the alphas are between two and three, sometimes less than two. And in transformer models, the alphas are between three and four. 
And it's sort of coming, this is this plot is actually from someone else's sort of in the literature sort of noted now that they believe that the these computer vision ResNet models might be a little overfit. And that the transformer models being uh, are, are actually perform better in computer vision tasks. And what we're sort of uh, and we believe and they believe that the lost landscapes for transformers are actually flatter than ResNet. And in some cases, as you saw earlier, uh, the ResNet alphas are less than two. And, and we suspect that some of the earlier layers in these convolutional networks may actually be a little overfit. Uh, this is predicted from our um, heavy-tailed self-organization theory, uh, but it's also consistent with uh, what people are seeing. And again, sort of the idea came from this old paper where if you were to compare a random spin glass versus a heavy-tailed spin glass, in a random spin glass, things would be like pathologically flat and impossible to optimize. And when you have very, very heavy tailed spin glasses, you would get uh, a global energy landscape with a single look with a single global minimum. And so we think that empirically somewhere in between here, we can use this alpha metric to give sort of a coarse grain empirical characterization of the global energy landscape or the global optimization landscape for these neural networks. And we even think you could do it layer by layer. So in our model, you can actually look layer by layer and actually get some understanding of how the layers themselves are converging, again, without looking at any data. So I'm going to kind of stop here. You can kind of go through, I have sort of more of like sort of how we derive things um, if you want to go through it. But this is the basic idea. Um, th this is sort of the motivation. This paper was the motivation for a lot of what we're doing. And what I'm trying to do here with the statistical mechanics is just sort of sketch out how we think we can actually derive the Weight Watcher metrics using these approaches. And, you know, it's sort of a first pass of what we're doing. There's probably a lot more that can be done. Um, and I'll stop there and see if anyone has any questions. Thanks a lot, Charles. Thank you. Okay, so um, are there any questions? among the people who are here. Okay, I fooled you. <laughs> I have a couple, but I'll, I'll wait first. If please, you... please. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you very much for this talk. It, it was uh, really interesting. Um, I, was, I was in particular interested in like the analysis you did over the generalization quality with respect to the metric that you that you introduced, and what I was wondering um, was whether you, you could do this, or you showed how to do this on a transformer. But I was also wondering whether you had uh, done this for uh, convolutional uh, networks, uh, that is, to do the analysis during the training, and see whether you can uh, also have the correlation between the alpha and the generalization performance uh, through through the training. No, no, we haven't. The only one who's actually started doing training at these big models has been Yao Chang, um, who's a postdoc with Michael. And we've really focused on the transformers because in industry, that's sort of where things are. Um, I, I would love for someone to try it, but I haven't looked at training of, of, of the high performance um, computer vision models, mostly because at this point, that stuff's in hardware. <laughs> so, you know, from a, from a business perspective, like, I would have no ability at all to work in that space at this point. You know, it's so well advanced, but the transformer models are, you know, totally open domains. So that's why we've been looking at them. Okay. And, and, and in particular, so the next question I had, which, which was, uh, I mean, it's not uh, necessarily related to a, to a CNN that can be applied for a transformer as well, but like, what about you have the same architecture, but you just have so different initialization, different seeds. Um, can you at some point during the training detect that this is, let's say, a bad seed just because the, the, the alpha isn't going to where you want it to be? And we, compare... we have we, we have done some work. There's a fellow um, uh, who has been working with me. We haven't published this yet, uh, James, who has he hasn't been doing computer vision, but he has been looking at various kinds of seeds on on on, on things like Albert. And trying to understand, you know, can we get some idea of using alpha to study the robustness and stability of the training? Because what you find is that when you, so not with computer vision, but we've started doing this with transformer models to see what we can tell. Um, what we find is that the alpha is not, it's not sensitive enough 
to see those kinds of fine grain details. You probably have to go to the truncated power walls or something like the random distance metrics. And even there, we, we got in trouble. What, what he found is that if you train like 20 models, two or three of the seeds will just cause the model to totally fail. Like it's totally wrong. So you can see it in the alpha, but you also see like the model's just totally broken. Um, so you can, there is some work on that. If you follow up with me, I can show you what he's doing. Maybe we could write it up. Um, we've done some of that. Uh, we, we've tried to, to study the stability of the, of the seed. Um, we, we have found there's some inconsistencies between what we see and other things. So it's a, it's a tough problem. So we started looking at it, but you know the results were nowhere near ready to publish that yet. But we have seen a little bit of that, yes. Okay, thank you for your answer. It was a great Sure. Question. Thank you. Can I have a question? Please, please. Uh, yes, uh, very interesting uh, topic. Uh, I actually wonder, um, for the CNNs and, and other neural networks, are, are the analysis different because like the kernels, you have some additional kernels. So what we have to do with, that's a good question. With the CNNs, what we did is just, again, the dumbest thing possible, the most naive thing possible. I took the CNNs, I just sliced them up. I just took the layers, I sliced them uh, in a way that I would get a large matrix. The, the tool, the Weight Watcher tool actually supports different ways of trying to analyze the CNNs. And for example, you can do a Fourier transform, like a discrete Fourier transform and extract out the linear operator defining the convolutional matrix. If you do that, the alphas are totally different. Like they're all like really small and you get, but you also get a gazillion, you know, a very, very large number of eigenvalues. It's hard to analyze. Um, you have to be careful when doing the CNN analysis because if you, you know, in the original paper, there's a, there's a, a, a there's a option in, in Weight Watcher called WW2X. And that's sort of the old version of how we did it. We would slice up the CNNs, compute the alpha for each of the slices, and then average it for the layer. If the other approach now is you take the CNNs, you slice up all, and you take all the eigenvalues and you combine them. And then you do the alpha like that. You actually get different results. And it's actually more stable. Yeah, we think like it's more stable to take the CNNs, slice them up, Com average compute alpha for each one of them and then compute the average alpha. We think that's a more robust estimator than trying to combine them. But it, it's a little tricky. We have a paper in the appendix, you know, one of these conference meetings where we describe all of this. And I'm happy if you want to try it on CNNs, I'm happy to show you the different options in the tool and, and how it works and what you can do. And but it's tricky. The, okay, thanks. And will the, the lo locality of the kernels uh, make any difference? Like for the analysis? Well, we, we, don't, we haven't been training our own models. We just pick models off the shelf and just do kind of naive. We're sort of like, I'm a, I was like a chemist, you know, doing spectroscopy. Someone gives me a molecule, I, I, I shine a laser on it. So I don't know. I mean, you, we could try training them and see what happens. I, again, it, it's at that kind of fine level of detail, you really have to get the shape really, really carefully, right? Like when you look at like VGG 11 versus VGG 19, that's pretty easy, right? It's a big difference. They're very, very different architectures. If you're trying to look at like VGG 11 and you tweak, you know, the uh, the size of the kernel in the, in the convolutional layer, that's probably going to be a very fine tuned change. And, you know, that uh, I'd love to try it, but we really have to be, um, you really have to work to get the, to characterize the shape of the distribution well. And in, in fact, in some of these cases, instead of doing the, like this is a theory, right? We try to present a, a physics theory, kind of physics-like theory. I guess. Um, it, it, there are other, in the tool, you can also take the weight matrices, randomize them, and then compare the randomized ma weight matrix, the spectral density of the randomized matrix to the actual spectral density and look at like the Shannon divergence, the Shannon Gen -Gen divergence between the layer and its randomized form. We call that the RAND distance metric. That's actually pretty good. That actually, that's a non-parametric way of determining how far away or how much correlation you have in the layer. So we, we have an option for doing that. Which, I mean, this alpha stuff is all parametric. We have shape metrics that are non-parametric, which work better when you're trying to do very, very fine-grained analysis. Thank you. Sure. So when you said the slice up the, the CNN layer, I, I'm not sure exactly what you meant. So basically like a convolutional layer is, is basically like a 4D tensor. And, and so yeah. when you see slice it up, do you mean sort of like vectorize it or? or um... 
uh, so it's say it's, it's say it's like three by three by sixty four by one twenty eight. Mm -hmm. Okay, you get nine slices that are sixty four by one twenty eight. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's what okay. it does. Okay. Because you need, and that, that's it's naive, the, the most naive thing you can do to get some weight matrices that are large enough to analyze. That, that's all we're doing. There are other, there are other, there's some ambiguity in how you do this. The tool will do anything you want, basically. But with the analysis we presented in the nature paper and here, that's how we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and that actually seems to work consistently. I see. And, um, yeah, I had, I had a, one thing I found uh, counterintuitive is the fact that like the alpha hat seems to increase through the layers because like you, I would kind of expect that the last layers are, are sort of more trained, particularly if you have, you know, like, you know, vanishing gradients or some problem of like- the, Okay, let me let me show you that because let's be careful yeah. that make, let's make that precise. Mm -hmm. um, that, 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 okay. So in VGG, we're looking at alpha, not alpha hat. This is okay. alpha, okay, looking at alpha. The last layers are here, mm -hmm. right? Because they're these three little, here they are. These are the three fully connected layers. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it does go down. So you have to be careful. The correlations go up and then boom, boom, boom. Then these three fully connected layers sort of capture, you know, sort of you have these convolutional layers that are sort of, you know, this sort of goes down in this funnel. And then you have this big layer at the end that tries to re-correlate to re everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're into, I think your intuition there is correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, any any other anything else I can I, I try to that we could do you could actually do a lot of things with the tool. Um, uh, we didn't show you everything, but basically the idea is that by looking, what we can do is we look at the individual layers, and so you can actually make statements about how well we think certain layers are trained or not trained. Uh, I don't think there's any other technique which allows you to do that. Right, because you, usually you look at the error, you're looking at the total Hessian or the Jacobian, something like this. You're not, you, you know, you're not looking at each individual layer, layer by layer, and trying to understand. Unless you were to like look at say the activations, and there that's data dependent, and uh, we're not data dependent. Oh, sorry. Hey. Uh, one one quick ahead, question. Go ahead, go ahead. So, sorry, this is maybe stupid, but like for, for the CNN, right, to have a three by three like kernel. So, if I assume that is actually a full kernel, but I set all others zero and I take kind of those uh, sparse matrix and do the same ana analysis, will that influence the alpha or? Uh, I mean, kind of that will be sing it. singular, right? Let's try it. You know, we, we, we just try to, well, I've been, I, I think it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ambiguity in how to do things. It's an engineering tool, okay. right? So I don't really know, right? I mean, a lot of this is sort of, I'm kind of, you know, we're just trying things and we got really lucky. Um, with the convolutional layers, I tried the simplest thing possible and it worked remarkably well. Um, I try not to break it, you know, I say something else, it might not work. I like you do other things and it like doesn't work at all. I'm like, well, I don't want to talk about that. I mean, that's the reality is that this, this all seems to work really well, but as soon as you start trying to fine tune or tweak things, it gets really you know, like, it's quite possible. We had like one fellow who was trying to do his thesis work and he had this, he, what, what we know that seems to work well, the, the key is that you have to have a lot of eigenvalues, obviously, because you know, you're, you're trying to fit it to a power wall. So you need to fit it. You need to have a lot of eigen, the matrix has to be big enough to analyze. And, and I think in a lot of the computer vision models, what happened is that over the years, people have been trying to, to shrink them down the layers so they can fit the layers into hardware, right? So you can run them because they're trying to run, you know, trying to put it in a car, you know, on a chip. And so a lot of the computer vision models have been, you know, they took like a big fat layer, which has lots of correlations in it, the way I see it. And they chopped it up, even if it's a big convolutional layer, and they broke it up into little parts and spread it out and connected it with the residual connections so they can fit it into hardware. So those are harder to analyze because you have these tiny little layers and they do various things and maybe they're singular and maybe they're not. So we, we haven't spent uh, an enormous amount of time on that. 
for us, the transformer layers have been more interesting because they're, they're all rectangular, right? So they're, and they're big. So it, there's not as much, the only ambiguity we haven't done is look at like, and I, some of the ideas like we're looking layer by layer, but we haven't looked, for example, in the transformers, like we have one layer that's connected right to the other without a relu in between. So there's like, we can actually do like, like layer, like cross layer interactions, like layer one, layer two, when we look at the cross correlations. We started looking at that, the tool will actually do it. Um, but the transformer layers for us have just been easier to analyze because they're bigger, you know, the layers are bigger um, and they're rectangular. We don't have these ambiguities, but I'm, I'm, the tool will support a number of things and I'm happy to, if you wanna try exploring, I, I would love to do that. Okay. And do you remember any effect of the nonlinearity? I mean, if you change a different nonlinearity, will that change the result? You mean the relu? You mean the-, the Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. we don't know because, uh -huh. um, we, we don't know because in, in these models, somebody else has trained them. And since somebody else trained the model, we don't know what they use, really. I mean, you can look, so we don't know. And, and we mm -hmm. usually, what we think of it is not so much a nonlinearity, but a sparsity transform. You know, that we think that what's happening is that um, the reason this works is even though there are layer layer cross interactions, that the sort of the, the activation function sparsifies their interaction. So it's not as important, but you know, those are things we've just started to look at. Thanks. You know, in other words, how does, how does the, um, so we haven't looked at them in, in great detail. I have one last question, maybe. Um, Please. My understanding is that, so when you initialize your, your weights, they're basically random. So you start for like infinite alpha, and then as you train, you, you gather more and more information. And so the, you, the your tail starts building. And so alpha becomes slower and That's lower. That's right. But like, um, what happens when you start overfitting? Like, can you see uh, with this, the alpha? Ah, okay. So what, what, what we think happens is that you get into this region where you get very, very heavy tail. Mm. and when it's too heavy tailed we think alpha gets less than two and mm. we think we can detect cases when you're overfit when alpha is too small okay so if alpha so remember we talked about these um we don't talk about this in the jmlr paper um because i only have a little bit of evidence of this and you know we we suspect what's going on is that if you move from this this is sort of the qualitative phenomenology right you move from this part this universality class to this one we think this one is overfit Mm. And, and the reason for that is imagine you're trying to sample, um, you're, trying to, you're trying to say, I have a, a model and I, I, the model, the weight matrices represent some sample of what we think real, of the true, of the teacher. You're a student and you're trying to sample the teacher and you're, you're, you're trying to guess the weight matrix. If the weight matrix is really, really heavy tail, then it doesn't have a mean. There's no mean value. That's what it means to be super real heavy tail. The mean is not well defined. So mm. it's atypical. Mm. So we think that, and that, and that idea that it being atypical is what makes it to be overfit. Because if you were to draw the weight matrix from some random, some random universality class, even though it's correlated, you draw it from this class, it's atypical. So it can only describe things that if you didn't draw another one, it, it would be completely different. And so that's sort of the qualitative argument of why we think when you get alpha less than two, you actually tend to overfit. And we actually have some examples of this. There's a fellow who was at a hedge fund um, who was using the tool and he had this example. It's actually on the Weight Watcher uh, homepage. I, I, think I, I think I can load it. Give me a second here. Um, uh, no, no, no. Here we go. Uh, yeah, it's on the it's on the page. I didn't include it in the talk, but there's an example of here it is. So this fellow um, Xander Dunn did this work, and what he did was he was training a transformer, and he was looking at the training loss and the validation loss, and he was plotting uh, the training loss, the validation loss, and the average alpha for the transformer. And what he found is that as he was training it, as the validation loss started to increase, alpha hit two and kept going down. Hmm. And I was astounded by this. That's incredible. <laughs> because, you know, that's exactly what theory would predict is that as soon as you start, to, you know, if your validation loss starts going up, it means you've overfit. 
and it means that alpha drops less than two. Now I haven't been able to reproduce this because you know was, he did this. He sort of showed it to me, and then he said, "Well, you know, I, I'm working at this fund. I can't really tell you what I'm doing. You know, I can't share anything more than that." But the idea is we thought we could use alpha as an early stopping criteria for training because when alpha gets less than two, you overfit. Mm -hmm. So we have some evidence that this works. It is, um, you know, it, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's, you know, of the level of something that we could publish, but certainly you could try it. And that's why I sort of say at the, at the end of the talk, I think it's at the end, right? This idea that when alpha is less than two, we think you're overfit. So we have some we have some qualitative ideas of why this would be true, and we have some empirical evidence that suggests it, but nothing that's been flushed out in a way that you could publish, but sort of anecdotal evidence that it seems to be correct. Very interesting. But you have to be very careful, right? Like if you if you were to change how you do the fits, or you change, you know, the you try to change how you do the compilation of fits, you might get very different alphas. This is all based on using sort of the, the default fits in the tool. But it does, we do think this is what's going on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we think that this is sort of consistent with, it's actually kind of consistent with the idea that, you know, the old ideas in statistical mechanics that um, um, when a model is overfit or overtrained, it's in the spin glass phase. So it undergoes this, you know, we have these models. We actually, Michael and I have a paper on this. We sort of tried to give a, uh, a summary to the computer scientists of what was going on in the old statistical mechanical or trying to get even really appreciate it, it wasn't a big hit but the idea was sort of this qualitative idea that you know models when you know they undergo they have phase behavior and when you decrease the load uh that's if you don't give the model enough training data it will undergo a phase transition and overfits the data um this is sort of old-fashioned these old models from in the 90s work by Tishby and people like this. And so that was sort of a, the, sort of the idea here is that what does it mean to be, what does it mean to be in one of these spin glass phases? It means that you're, you know, you're atypical. You're stuck in some region of phase space that you can't get out of. You're in some weird non-equilibrium part of phase space and you can't get back, you know, you're sort of trapped there. Mm -hmm. and, and that's sort of what we think of in these cases when alpha is less than two, the optimization landscape is just really, really sharp. And, you know, you can't really, the optimizer can't move around and can't find the other good parts of the space. Again, that's sort of hand wavy. You know, none of that has been really flushed out. We'd love to flush it out if someone wants to try it, but that's sort of what our thinking is on the problem. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, oh, that also points out also when you ask like doing replica calculations and things like that's why like we just assume that none of that is necessary. Like, you know, quenched and annealed is the same. Everything behaves normally. You're not in some weird space where that matters. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it's also because I'm too lazy, <laughs> you know, to do it. So, but if you would like to do it, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. Okay. Any, really, anything else? Really great talk. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it for us. So uh, thanks again. Hey, Will, I really appreciate you guys uh, giving me the chance to talk to you. And uh, these are great questions. Yeah. Hope to see you soon then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank Have, you a, very great, much. Have Bye. a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>